Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss the concept of involuntary conversions, section 1033. We have to put this concept in a context, and this context is non-taxable gains. So involuntary conversion is part of a series of transactions where the gain that you realize may not be taxable now. It will be deferred. What does that mean? If we remember the basic formula for computing the realized gain, which is amount realized minus the adjusted basis would either give us a realized gain or a realized loss. Let's assume we are dealing with a gain. So we sold something for 100,000. The cost basis was 60,000. Therefore, we have a gain of 40,000. Now, maybe this gain might be deferred. If it's deferred, then nothing will be recognized or this gain might be none of it is deferred and all of it is recognized means all of it is taxable so involuntary conversions fall into this category so notice we in the prior session we looked at qualified like-kind exchanges section 1031 in this session we would look at involuntary conversion and as i am preparing this recording hurricane ian is hitting florida and this picture is from florida actually and if you notice, it's an involuntary conversion. People, the owner of these, uh, the, these apartment building, they did not want this to happen. The owners of these boat, they didn't want this to happen. So they lost their asset involuntary. And this is what we mean by involuntary conversion. So a taxpayer may sell a property, exchange it or dispose of it, but in an involuntary conversion. Again, what could be an example of involuntary conversion? Well, destruction theft, seizures, requisition, condemnation, sale or exchange under the threat of condemnation of property. And we're going to talk about condemnation of property. Simply put, the, the taxpayer did not choose this. Something was forced on that taxpayer. However, if a voluntary act made by the taxpayer, that's not involuntary conversion. For example, if you destroy your own property, or if you, you know, put your property on fire, that's not going to be considered involuntary conversion. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. We have to understand that se section 1031 applies to gain realized from involuntary conversion, not for losses. And we'll talk about this later. Now, also you need to understand in contest to section 1031, which is like kind exchange treatment, the tax treatment of gains from involuntary conversion is not limited to real property. So if we go back to this picture, real property is the building, is the apartment building. This is real property. Personal property is the boat, or I'm not sure if you see a vehicle here or not, I'm not really sure. But section 1033 applies to real and personal property as well. Let's take a look at the gain rules. So an involuntary conversion the taxpayer usually would receive some sort of an insurance proceeds. So maybe the owner of the boat would receive some insurance proceed or a condemnation award if the government takes over your asset. They want to open a highway. They want to maybe build a public park. They want to build an airport and they want your land. They force you to sell it. They're going to give you something or some other at some other form of compensation that aim to restore the original owner, him or her to the position held right before the conversion. If the taxpayer receives replacement property or receive money and convert them into a replacement property within a specified period of time, he or she should not include any gain or loss. So what do you have to do? If you receive the money, and let's assume you receive the money and you happen to have a realized gain. Well, a realized gain could be recognized. Well, if you want to avoid the recognition, reinvest the money within a specified period of time, which we'll talk about. So the gain will be deferred. An exception applies when the taxpayer does not reinvest the entire amount realized. If, if, it means if you get the money 
And if you don't reinvest it, if you don't take this money and buy the property trying to replace, then guess what? The amount that's not invested will be taxable, will be recognized gain. Okay. And the basis, you need to know what the basis period, the basis and the holding period of the replacement property are the same as the converted. So they will start with the original property because you had no choice. Now, bear in mind, if the property is converted to money, simply put, you get the money and you're not going to do anything with it. They simply put, your boat was destroyed. You did not replace it. Well, or you replace it with some dissimilar property, the taxpayer would recognize a gain from the amount realized and the adjusted basis. Simply put, it's as if it's sold because you did not. The rules are if you wanted to reinvest the money in similar property to put you back in the original position, then that's fine. The government says, yes, we're willing to give you a break. Otherwise, if you're going to keep the money, it's as if you sold it. The basis of this similar property is determined by the cost of acquisition. Simply put, you are buying a new property, brand new, different. Now, the best is to look at an example. Ralph owned a van that he used to support people moving from one area to the other. The van operated for five years before it was completely destroyed by a fire that Ralph has nothing to do with the fire, involuntary, just to mention this. At the time of the fire, the van has an adjusted basis of 25 and a fair value of 26,200. That's not really kind of realistic in the real world because after you use a van, the fair value of it will be will, should be lower, but you know, just for the sake of illustration. Now, Ralph filed insurance claim and received 29,000. It must be worth it. In insurance proceeds, two months after the fire. So here's what's gonna happen. First, first we have to determine the amount realized. Well, the amount realized is what you received from the insurance company, 29,000 minus the adjusted basis, which will give us a realized gain by Ralph of 4,000. Now we need to determine how much of that amount is actually recognized. Recognized means taxable. Assume now that five months later, after Ralph has received the insurance, he purchased a new van for 28000 and resumed his work. Basically, he's back to where he was originally. Determine the amount of gain to be recognized by Ralph from the conversion of his old van and the basis of the newly acquired van. Well, here's what's going to happen. They gave him 29000 He only invested twenty eight. Well, guess what? The amount that he did not invest, he kept. He kept in his bank account. Now, Rolf has the ability to pay taxes on this gain of 1,000. So if we, we, we wanna look at it this way, the gain was 4,000, of which three is deferred or not taxable, and 1,000 is taxable, 1,000 is taxable. Now the new basis for the van is computed as follow. The acquisition cost of the new van, which is the 28,000, minus the deferred gain, so the deferred gain reduced your basis so you, you would recapture this gain down the road. Assume now that Ralph used the insurance proceeds to acquire a second hand van for 26 and to reimburse a loan he owns to the bank for 3000. That's what he did with the money now. Well, determine the amount of gain to be recognized because we already computed the amount realized. In this case, Ralph would recognize a gain of 3000, which is the amount of insurance proceeds collected and not invested in the replacement property. You did not reinvest this. You just basically paid off the loan. Ralph's basis in the new property equal to the amount reinvested, which is 26,000 minus the deferred gain. Here, the deferred gain is 1,000. Remember, we said the, the, the gain was four. He invested, he paid the bank, paid 3,000 to the bank, and 1,000 was actually deferred because it was invested in the van. Therefore, 26 minus the, the deferred portion, the deferred portion will give us a basis of 25,000. Now let's talk about loss rules. We have to keep in mind that section 1031, now let's talk about loss rules. It's important to note that involuntary conversion does not apply to losses. If the losses are realized, they are recognized. Now bear in mind, losses from personal use property are no, neither recognized nor postponed. So keep that in mind, We're still, you are still dealing with business use or personal and real property. Example, Ralph owned a van that he used to support people moving from one area to the other. The van was operated for five years, was completely 
destroyed by the fire. At the time of the fire, the van had an adjusted basis of 25, a fair value of 26,200. Now, Ralph filed the claim and the insurance company only gave Ralph $8,000. Now we have to complete the realized gain or loss, which is we have a loss here. The loss is the difference between what he received from the insurance company, 25, 25 uh, what he received from the insurance company, 18,000, and the basis of 25, which is the loss is 7,000. Now, the entire loss is recognized. Why? Because it's a loss. Involuntary conversion don't ask you to, def to defer the loss. In contrast, in contrast to Section 1031, Section 1031, you always have to defer the loss. Just I'm making this point, comparing and contrasting. Now, we have to learn about rules that deals with Section 1031, specific rules, requirements you might be asked about. As mentioned, to be eligible for non-recognition under Section 1033, not 1031, the person should reinvest the insurance proceeds in the replacement property. That's given. You have to reinvest. If you, if you keep the money, it becomes taxable. It means now you have cash in the bank. The IRS says, well, guess what? You have the ability to pay us. You should pay us. In addition, the property should be acquired within a specified period, which we're going to talk about. What is the definition of a replacement property? A replacement property should be similar or related in service or, or use to the involuntary converted property. Now, when it comes to Section 1033, they are more restrictive than Section 1031. If you remember in Section 1031, I said, I am not going to go into the rules of Section 1031. Uh, what's a qualified property? They will give you this. But I can tell you this much. They don't care if you replaced a warehouse with a building or a land with something else. As long as it's real property, they're very flexible. When it comes to Section 1033, it has to be similar or related in service. So we're going to see what we mean by this. The definition of replacement property differ based on whether the owner of the property is an owner investor or an owner user. So you could be an owner of an asset, a fleet of trucks. You, you, you are the investor of that company that's that's one option or you can be the owner the owner user you can be the owner of that truck personally not the owner of the rental property and using it yourself also there are different rules for property condemnation so we're going to go over the rules briefly just to know so if it's an owner invested there's something called use test an example of an owner invested would be a taxpayer who owned property and rent it to another party so you own the truck but you don't use the trucks you rent them to another property so you'll be basically the lessor. You're the investor. For an owner investor, the, the replacement property must be used in similar endeavor. In other words, the taxpayer use test must be satisfied. In similar endeavor, there doesn't have to be the same, but similar. For example, a taxpayer converting a rental apartment building may be replaced with another property that produces rental income. They're okay with this. However, a rental property building cannot be replaced with a personal residence. You cannot say, okay, I lost my rental apartment building. I want to uh, buy a house with that money. That's not acceptable. But you can buy another rental business. That's okay if you would invest your money in another rental business. It doesn't have to be rental apartment building. This is owner investor. Now, if we look on the other hand, owner user, which is it means there's a function, functional use test here. An owner user is a taxpayer who owns the property and uses it in his or her own business or trade, like manufacturer who owns an income producing property. Under those circumstances, you are more restrictive. Okay? So if you lost this asset, you have to replace it with not the exact, but similar in use. So the rule that apply to owner investor are more restrictive than those applicable to owners, owners investor. In detail, the replacement property must have the same, not similar, sorry, I said similar, the same use to the owner as the converted property. So, for example, a manufacturing plant is not considered a replacement property for a wholesale grocery warehouse. So you cannot replace those. You have to get a manufacturing plant. You have to get back to your manufacturing plant. Each property has a different function to the owner user because a manufacturing plant is totally different than a wholesale grocery warehouse. You would say a grocery warehouse. But if you are renting apartment building and now you're renting truck, you're still in the rental business if you're owner investor. Now, property condemnation is when the government takes over your asset by force through something we call eminent domain because they want, again, uh, expand the highway, uh, build an airport, whatever the reason is. 
It's when the government forces the taxpayer to give up the property. In general, the rules that apply to the replacement of condemnation property are more flexible. They have to, because now the government is forcing you to do something, which is, you, most people, they do fight this in the court, but if they eventually lost, well, at least the IRS should give them some flexibility in this. So there are more flexible than those applicable to other involuntary converted property. For example, an improved real property may be replaced with an un unimproved. It means it, you, there's nothing on it. Improved mean you know it's zoned, it's ready to be uh, to be sold as separate unit. You can replace it with un unimproved real property. The time period, how long do you have? The taxpayer generally will have normally will have two year period after the close of the taxable year in which the gain was realized to replace the converted property with another qualifying property. This is for individual. The time period is extended to three years for condoned business property. If that's the case, three and four years for principal residents destroyed in federally declared, dec declared disaster area. Most likely from the Hurricane Ian, that's going to be a federally, most likely federally declared disaster area. The replacement time period starts from when the involuntary conversion or the threat of the condemnation occurred. This Let's take a look at an example to see how the time period works. A taxpayer office building was destroyed by a fire on December 31st, year X4, X3, sorry. So this is X3, and the building was destroyed, the office building was destroyed on December, toward the end of the year. On April 10th, X4, so simply put, a few months later in X4, the taxpayer received the insurance and decided to use the, the entire amount to acquire a replacement building. Now, what is his or what is her replacement period. Well, guess what? This is a business property. You still have, the taxpayer would have still have up to X5 and X6. So three year after the close year, this is a business property. So notice it's a very generous, it's a very generous period for business property. Three years after the close year of what happened which is X3. Now think about it, if this happened at the beginning of X3, then you'd have one, two, three, almost four years to do the replacement. So it's very important to understand involuntary conversions. How do involuntary conversion work? Section 1033. Again, we looked at section 1031, section 1033. We have other transactions such as the sale of taxpayer principal residence. Again, all these transactions falls under the umbrella of it's either non-taxable or deferred. We're going to see that the sale of tax, ta taxpayer principal residence just simply it's non-taxable gain. And we'll see the rules when we cover this, when we cover this topic. What should you do now? Go to Farhat Lectures, whether you are a CPA candidate, EA candidate, or an accounting student. It's very important that you understand this topic. You don't take any chances on property transaction, whether an EA exam or CPA exam. I'm here to help. Good luck. Study hard and stay safe.